It is good to see everybody today. And uh, last Sunday, uh, William shared a message with us uh, starting a series that we're doing right now, building up to the holidays and and uh, getting into the, the, that time. But before we get there, we want to take some time and, and uh, think about uh, worship. And uh, I thought William did an excellent job last week of putting the perspective of where worship is is a time whenever it's not something we come and do uh, it's a way we live and uh, it's something every day all day uh, it's something should be a part of our lives as Christians and and as we live our daily lives for for Christ it should be an attitude of worship in everything we do but every Lord's Day we do come together we do meet. You're here. Uh, some are off hunting. I know they told me so. <laughs> I hope they're worshiping out there, and I'm not so uh, much hoping they'll shoot something. They need to learn that you don't hit anything on Sunday morning. That's my theory. <laughs> Some will probably defy that, but that's my theory. You're not going to get anything on Sunday morning. But anyway, uh, but every Lord's Day we do come together. We assemble together as body of Christ to praise and to worship together. And this is not something that just happened. It's not something that just came about by man's thinking or man's idea. Uh, this was a plan of God from the beginning. That we come together and we, we as, as a body, as a group, as like uh, Christians, that we come together and we, we uh, in fellowship with one another, worship God. And so, actually, uh, in the days of old, it was uh, uh, on what they called the Sabbath day. <laughs> And it was even part, if you remember, the Ten Commandments. Whenever in the Ten Commandments, one of those commandments was, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, the writer describes why this time that we come together is so uh, important. Over in Hebrews 10th chapter, 19 through 25th verse, we read, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, and I'm going to tell more about that in a moment, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, His body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, which is Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to, to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. Notice that at the beginning of this passage I just read here, the writer said that we can enter the holy place with confidence by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is why we're here. The blood of Jesus is the reason why that we're Christians. The blood of Jesus is why we can enter with confidence the holy place. Actually, the holy of holies, we sometimes call it, which was forbidden before Jesus died upon the cross to, for, for anyone to go in except for the priest once a year to, to offer sacrifice for the people into the holy of holies. But the veil was split when Jesus died, and we now have entrance into the very presence of God. So we actually come in to the presence of God as we come to worship Him. We assemble together each Lord's Day. We take a portion of our time to remember that sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross through what we call the communion service. This, again, was not man's idea. It was God's idea. It was God's plan from the beginning. And all has to do with sacrifice. Sacrifice has been a part of God's plan all the way back to Eden. In fact, we see all things were created perfect. All things that God made and He put upon this earth, including man and woman, were perfect. But that all changed whenever we messed it up with sin. And we see that sin entered into this world through, of course, the disobedience, first of all, of Adam and Eve. And when they sinned, they felt something that they hadn't felt before that. They felt guilt. They felt shame. 
And over, like we read over in Genesis 3.21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve, Adam and his wife, and clothed them. And the word here for skin is the word uh, in the language OWR. That's, that's all the bigger. OWR uh, is that word in, in the language, which is the word for hide. Uh, the same word, an animal skin. There's no one in all of theology and all, all of the study of this that thinks it's anything else. Uh, that this is, is uh, animal skin that God took to clothe them. Why animal skin? Do you ever think about that? God just created everything. He created everything that is in all the world. He created all the animals. He created the people. Couldn't He have created a smock? You know, or coat, or or something. Did you ever think about that? He 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 created could create stuff out of nothing, and he could have done that to clothe them. But but God started the very principle of what sacrifice is all about, right out of the Garden of Eden. He, Adam and Eve knew where God got their garments. They knew animals had to die. They knew that their shame was being covered by the sacrifice of those animals. And thus the definition of sacrifice came about. The death of the innocent to cover the guilt or the shame or the sin of those who are guilty. And thus we see this continued to be an important part of worship of God from that time on. Later on down in Genesis and fourth chapter, the third through the fifth verse, in the course of time, Cain brought some fruits. Now, the indication here is, is this was a common practice. And Cain brought some, some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. This was their worship. And there was offering to the Lord in worship. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. There's a debate as to why God looked to favor one and not the other, but I agree with those who feel that the reason was because Abel brought uh, from the sacrifice of an animal of his first flock where the fruit of the soil was not a blood offering. Again, that's debated, but it makes sense if you think about what sacrifice is all about. Of course, we know that the result of this was Cain was upset. And Cain killed his brother Abel, and the first murder on earth happened. And the practice of offering animals as sacrifice then, though, even continued. We know when the flood came, there were animals that were specifically taken on the ark, specifically for the purpose of sacrifice. And when the waters subsided and finally they were able to exit the ark, the very first thing they did was built an altar. And over in the 8th chapter, it says uh, of Genesis 20 and 21, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of, of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it, worshiping immediately. And the first thing they did was worship God as soon as they got off the ark. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in, in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Later when the nation of Israel was in bondage, uh, we know that, that uh, Moses was the one chosen to deliver them out of the bondage of Egypt. And curses came upon Egypt to try to get them to release, and Pharaoh would not release them. But finally, uh, the curse of the firstborn was pronounced. And on that night of the curse of the firstborn, only those who had the blood of the sacrificial lamb over the doorpost were saved from that curse. And, and did not die. From then on, they observed the Passover, remembering that God passed over their house because the blood of the Lamb was on the, on the uh, doorpost, and that saved him from the curse. Later, God made the sacrificial system an important part of the law of Moses. It was actually le legally made a part of their worship, a part of their lives a part of their system, if you will, of forgiveness. 
and says, and, and we see that, that uh, the method that was used was they would take animals and the specific ones to specific ways. The law was very distinct at what, what it said and how to offer these sacrifices. There were sacrifices that were offered on the Sabbath for the sins, their sins of the people, and they had to bring certain animals to offer then. And then there was one day of a year they called the Day of Atonement where the high priest would enter into that Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and later the temple and offer uh, uh, sprinkled blood over all the elements in the Holy of Holies, offering uh, a covering for the sins of the people. But that covering was just that, a covering. Uh, it did not cleanse the people from their sins, but it only covered them and held them back for something greater. As described for us clearly in the book of Hebrews as to what that was all about. In the 10th chapter, starting the first verse, the law is only a shadow. And that was the law of this sacrificial system. And that was only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an animal, annual, <laughs> annual reminder of sin. That's all they did. They just remind them of sin and they, the need for forgiveness of sin, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for Me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here am I. It is written about Me in the scroll. I have come to do Your will, O God." First, he said, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here am I. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first, that law system, that old sacrificial system. He sets aside the first to establish the second the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It, it, a tremendous book. I hope you just haven't, if you haven't done it, to do it, to sit down and just in one sitting, it's not that long, read through the book of Hebrews. It so, so much gives us the explanation of why Jesus had to die on the cross. Jesus changed everything. He brought a sacrifice that is once and for all, and it, it, it was a sacrifice that just didn't cover sin. It cleansed sins away. Took them away. The very fact is the basis of our faith. The that very fact is, is the very essence of Christianity. In fact, that fact is the basis of all mankind's hope. When we accept Christ... We are proclaiming that we accept, are accepting His sacrifice for our sins. We're taking His blood and letting it flow over our sins. Interestingly enough, it was, it was uh, at the Passover celebration. Uh, they were celebrating the Passover of the death angel because the blood was on the, the post of the doorpost of, of those Israel in Egypt. And every year from that moment on, they had a celebration and called it the Passover, one of the main things the Jews did every year, one of the main feasts. And it was at that Passover celebration that the twelve disciples and Jesus got together to have a meal. And Jesus stood up and He announced His own sacrifice that was about to come. In the tradition of Passover, whenever you had a Passover meal, there were certain things that you did ritualistically through that Passover meal every time. And in that ritual of, of, of observing the Passover meal, you, you had cups that meant different things. And uh, uh, it, they depicted different aspects of the Passover and the salvation uh, of the people from the bondage that they were in. But Jesus broke 
tradition. He took one cup and he picked up that cup and his 12 disciples probably about that time thought he was going to go into uh, the Passover uh, uh, liturgy, if you will, as to, to what exactly they had seen over and over their entire lives. But Jesus did something I think probably startled them. He took that one cup and he picked it up and he said totally, totally, totally different words. Over in Luke 22, starting down the 15th verse, it says, And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this, divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them. This is my body. <laughs> this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. In that moment, the Lord established something that was going to be a part of his church clear until he comes again. Hebrews put it this way again over in Hebrews 9 chapter and I'll try to keep up this time. Uh, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that come that are already here, he went through a greater and more perfect tabernacle, that is, not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of, of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are, are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. And that's what they thought. It, it, was, it was a symbol of cleanliness. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death? so that we may serve the living God. The Apostle Paul would later make it even more clear as to the importance of meeting around this table on, on the Lord's Day. Whenever he was writing to the New Testament church that was established in Corinth, and there they had had the practice because it was instituted from the beginning in the church, of meeting around the Lord's table and having communion. But the Corinthians had totally missed the point, or at least they had distorted the point of why they were there, of why they were meeting, as why they were communing, and why and how it is an important part of worship. They were even abusing it. So in rebuke, if you will, Paul wrote his first letter of Corinthians. And he said in that 11th chapter down to the 20th verse, When you come together, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. You're supposed to be. You're, you're supposed to be eating the Lord's Supper, but it's not what you're doing. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. That's really dipping into the old sauce, huh? Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Let me tell you again. You wasn't listening the first time. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant 
in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, whenever that is, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that doesn't mean I'm a sinner, so I'm unworthy. That means that in a abuseful way the Corinthians were doing. If, you're, if you abuse it, if you do it in an unworthy manner, you will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. What should you be doing? Well, a man or a woman, that's mankind, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. There's a debate whether that's referring to physically or spiritually. I lean towards spiritually. But it may have some physical implications. But the reason why you're a weak Christian, the reason why you're a sick Christian, the reason why you are falling asleep as a Christian and no longer living as a Christian is because of your lack of recognition of what this is all about, of what Jesus has done for you. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment when we are judged by the Lord. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So conclusion. So then, brothers, I just messed myself all up. So then, brothers, <laughs> When you come to eat, wait for each other. I'll get there. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> wait for each other. When you come to eat, if anyone is hungry, go home and eat. So that when you meet together, you may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give you even further instruction on this because you need it. Sometimes people will ask... Why, why do you take communion every Lord's Day in your church? Why, why do you do that? Why, we, could, we could say, and a lot of times people will say, well, you know, it was a pattern of the first century church. I mean, we can go to Acts 20, verse 7, and we can see that there's a pattern there that, that uh, they met on the first day of the week to break bread. And so we want to keep that tradition. We want to keep that pattern going just as it was in the first century church. But we see that by itself, that's, that's not wrong, but that by itself would not be a totally good reason to continue to meet around the Lord's table every Lord's Day. When we come to worship God as an assembly of believers, the very reason we come and the very center of why we come is because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Because of, of His sacrifice on the cross, and that is the reason why we're here. That is the reason why we're saved. That is the reason why we sing praises. That is the reason why we pray. Is because Jesus died on that cross. And this table of remembrance of that sacrifice is now our worship altar. The most important centerpiece within the worship that it always has been since Eden. It's not covered now, though. It's actually a good-looking piece of furniture. And it's not covered with the blood of animals. It's not covered with, with the, the smell and all the things that went along with that sacrifice under the law. It is, however, covered with the blood of Jesus. And even though the elements that we take are quite small. We haven't come here to eat a meal. We are here to remember a meal that took place in the upper room over 2,000 years ago when Jesus stood up and broke tradition and announced that finally, 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 the sacrifice is being made that will not just cover your sins, 
but will cleanse your sins forever. And he says, as often as you do this, whenever you do this, and you meet around this table, you are proclaiming that death. And we're to do it until he comes again. And it continues on, because if you'll notice in that one passage, he made the statement that whenever I do this again with you, to his disciples, it will be in heaven. We'll continue to commune. We'll continue to, to, I don't know what form, but we'll continue to worship. We'll continue to sing. We'll continue to be together. We won't have to come to meet together. We will be together as a church eternal, worshiping, praising God forever. We need to realize as we think about these elements of worship, as we think about how worship matters, that the most important part of worship is meeting around this table. There's a lot more about this, and I'm going to share, and we're going to talk about it more tonight in our evening class. And there's, there's elements involved of why we take what we take, and there's situations uh, that uh, uh, people have questions about. But the bottom line is, is we can't help. We can't help but come into worship and not think about Jesus and what he's done for us he died for us that was the only way there was no other way there's no other means he died for every one of you he died for every one of them out there wherever they may be in all the world he loved the world so much that he gave God loved the world so much that he gave his only son it's up to us whoever believes in him trust Him, decide to follow Him, put, it, put our lives in His hands, and accept that sacrifice and receive that blood over us. We, we find in the Scriptures that uh, we make the decision to be baptized in Him. That blood comes in contact with us, and our sins are washed away. When we do that, we have a reason to worship. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Let's stand as we sing.